Amen. Well, thank you for your giving, and let's just continue to believe for even more. Amen. Well, you guys are in for a treat this morning. We, as a pastoral staff, will just be sharing. We want to set the stage for what God wants to do in 2022. And so the staff will be sharing on just important principles of why we fast and what God can do in fasting. Amen. It's important to share in the same way physically, and I've done this before, you don't eat all you can the night before a fast and then jump into it because that can do some heavy damage to your body. There's things that we have to do physically to prepare for a fast. And in the same way, there's things I believe spiritually that we want to do for a fast. And so we don't want to just look till Sunday night, January 2nd to go all in. We want to begin to do that even now in the weeks leading up to it. Amen. And so we as a staff are going to share just an acrostic with the letters for the word fast, F-A-S-T. And through these these, um, principles, we want to encourage you to have excitement going into the fast. Sometimes the flesh doesn't want to be any, have anything to do with it, but if we can allow our spirit, man and woman, to rise up and understand that what God wants to do through the fasting, then we're going to go to it and we're going to prepare the way that we need to leading up to it. Amen? So this morning, we're going to, as a pastoral staff, go through it. Please give your undivided attention and have some expectancy. Pastor Lisa is going to begin with the letter F. Day after Christmas. We're glad you're here this morning. And I don't know about you, spiritually and health wise, I think we've all done a lot of eating. I, f- I feel like I don't need to eat for another week. I'm sure that will change in a few hours. But, but I want to focus on the word freedom this morning. The first letter in the word fast is F, and we are going to focus on the word freedom this morning. Galatians 5 1 says it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Another translation says, at last we have freedom for Christ has set us free. And I love this. We must always cherish this truth and firmly refuse to go back into the bondage of our past. Another translation, so Christ has made us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get all tied up again in the chains. Another rendition, it means that we are really free. Are are we catching on to this? We are really free. Don't lose the freedom. Walk in the freedom. Hold on to your freedom and don't ever become slaves of the law again. Christ has set us free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never again let anyone put a harness of slavery upon you. So those are just some different renditions of this scripture. But basically it is saying Christ has given us freedom. And he's given us what we need in his word choice to continue that. And so during a fast, one of the things that we can pray about is God would help us to walk in that freedom. And if you want to know what you can be free from, maybe there is habitual sin in your life. Maybe there are mistakes from your past that you feel guilty about. Maybe you deal with anxiety. Maybe you deal with memories of things going over and over again in your mind that you need to be free from. So one of the reasons we fast is to experience freedom in our lives, freedom from sin and strongholds. We fast to experience freedom from what people may have done to us. You know, sometimes people have moved on after they've hurt us. They're not even thinking about it anymore, but we're still stuck in the bondage of those things. We need to be free from that. We fast to be free to forgive. We fast to be able to forgive others and receive forgiveness for ourselves. You know, I, I, sometimes we talk about having to forgive others all the time, but we need to for, forgive ourselves. Maybe from the past, maybe from guilt, maybe from some mistakes that you've made. Maybe there's a long list of mistakes that you've made. God wants us to be free from living in that guilt. So we fast for freedom. Here's one definition. Freedom is continually pursuing wholeness in your life by pressing toward the high call of God in Christ. You might say, well, what is the high call 
of God in Christ. I would put it into these words. It's following God's plan for your life. It's being free to do what God has asked and ordained for you to do in your life. That is the high call of God on your life. We th- sometimes people, you know, hear the word high call. That means they're going to be these high profile people that are known all over the world for the ministry they do. Let me tell you, God knows the nursery workers that are in the nursery right now, caring for the little tiny children that are too fussy to be in the sanctuary so that you can be in here if you're a parent and those that are sitting around you can be in here with some peace and quiet. God notices those people. They have a hard job back there. They are, they are walking in the high calling of God, if you ask me. Another definition, freedom is me choosing. See, I have to make that choice. You can't make it for me, and I can't make it for you. As pastoral staff, we meet with many, many, many people, and we can share tools, right? We can share uh, scripture. We can share our life experience. We can share wisdom that God has given us through our own brokenness in life. But the people that we talk with have to make the choice themselves to receive that and walk in that. And that comes with being free in Christ. See, if you're living a very defensive life, you are not free in Christ. And you ask me how I know that? Because I used to be there myself, and I completely understand what that feels like. And it's exhausting. To be free in Christ means that you can look in the mirror and say to you, and we used to talk about this in our ladies' life group many years ago, you can look in the mirror and say you are ugly. It's very quiet in here right now. And I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about the inside. Sometimes what's on the inside is very ugly, and we need to be able to say that. But that can only come when we're free, and Christ frees us up to look at that stuff that needs to change and say, yeah, that's ugly, and that needs to be gone from my life. Freedom is me choosing day after day to make a decision to move past the hurts and scars. Anybody have hurts and scars? Okay that led me down the wrong path and choosing instead to serve Christ with my whole heart. Letting go of the scars, letting go of the past. Yes, sometimes people need counseling. They need prayer. They need someone to talk with and share with and walk with them through. We've all needed that at times in our lives. But we need to choose day after day to walk in that freedom. Can we really be free, you might ask? The answer is yes. Emphatically, yes, we can be free. In in fact, freedom is promised in this verse. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. In other words, he's giving us a, a, a good explanation. It was for freedom. That might sound very elementary, but we need the reminder. In other words, Christ died on the cross to make us free. God wants us to be free from being tied to anything that is holding us in bondage. And let me tell you, that can be a whole gamut of things. Drugs, alcohol, pornography, overeating, television garbage, anything and everything that we are in bondage to. If you can't wait to get home and watch something on TV that's garbage and full of swearing and cursing and sex and and idolatry and adulterous affairs, if you just can't wait to get in front of the TV, you need to be set free from that bondage. We, all, we just think it's, it's, it's alcohol or drugs or something that we're putting into our bodies, bond, bodies. No, we need to be free from many, many things that are holding us back from walking in the high call that God has for each and every one of us. And so when we fast, we deny our flesh food and we open our hearts even more than ever. You might say, well, I can, I can eat food and still hear from God. Yeah, we can, but fasting gives us an edge that we can really hear from God. And not only that, but the time that we're cooking and eating, we're praying instead. See, that's a, that's a key. And you're probably going to hear that over and over again during the prep for the fast and during the fast. Make sure that when you're not eating and not shopping and not cooking, you're spending time with God. Another scripture, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Another, that's John 8, 36, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
We don't have to ask to be free. We already are. Now, that's a really difficult concept to, to really get in our minds. I'll admit it is for me, even thinking that. We don't have to say, God, make me free. We have to begin to walk in the freedom that he's already given us through the cross of Christ. If you have submitted your life to Christ and asked him to be Lord of your life, you are free. That's true whether we know it or not, whether we feel it or not. We don't go by feelings. We go by faith in the word of God. And he is telling us in Galatians, he has set us free. And one last thought, freedom isn't really just about me or you. God doesn't grant us freedom so that we can feel good, although it's good to be free and to feel free and to walk in the freedom and worship and dance in the freedom. That will happen. But real true freedom is not meant as something that's only for you. Freedom means getting rid of things that hold you back so that you can serve God and live out your purpose, and that will affect those around you. So we want to encourage you, take part in the fast, put freedom on your prayer list, whatever you need. Ask him, ask God, whatever those things are that you need freedom, be precise in your prayers. And we know that God will help you. Amen. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Another reason we fast, the next letter is answers. How many need an answer in some area in your life? The Bible says in Isaiah 58, 9, when you call upon the Lord, he will answer. So that's a promise. He will answer. We just got to seek him for the answer. Sometimes I believe God wants us to seek him with all our hearts. And when we are willing to set aside this time to fast and deny ourselves of food, you know that gets God's attention. What are you seeking for? What are you looking for answers for? Be specific. Pastor Lisa was alluding to that, alluding to that. And we need to be specific in what a lot of times we pray in general, and then we don't know when God answers. But when you're praying specifically for an area in your life, you're going to know when God answers it. Amen? So be specific. And like Pastor Lisa said, start asking God, what is it that he wants you to really seek him for during this prayer and fasting? I know there are many here that are in desperate need of a touch from God and a word from God. You're seeking answers. And you may be seeking God's will in a major area in your life. Maybe you're in a fork road in your life and you need to know God's way, whether it's a job offer, a ministry, a move of some kind, you know, it could be college for the children, it could be relationships, there's so many things. Maybe it's a family issue, or you need guidance or protection. Well, take this time to come together with us corporately. There's power when we come together corporately. There is power. We do it every year, a couple of times a year, and it's always timely when Pastor calls the fast, and especially at the beginning of the year. We need to seek God for the future. We need to seek God for this new year. Pastor was praying this morning. We haven't passed this way before. We don't know what the future holds. So we need to be prepared. We need to be fulfilling that high calling that God's called us to because time's short, people. We need to be seeking God for answers. A few passages I wanted to share how God answered when people prayed and fasted in the Bible. Judges 20, verses 26 to 28, it said, The children of Israel sought God for guidance or direction here. It says, Then all the children of Israel, that is, all the people, went up and came to the house of God and wept. They, they sat there before the Lord and fasted that day until evening, and they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. So the children of Israel inquired of the Lord. The Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out against to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into your hands. So once again, they fasted 
and sought God and prayed for a specific answer, and God gave him that specific answer. Ezra, another one, he sought God. In chapter 8, when Ezra was carrying a large amount of gold and silver, he was going to Jerusalem along a route that was infested with bandits. And in verse 21, it said, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek him for the right way for us and our little ones in all our possessions. So we fasted and entreated our God for this, and he answered our prayers. Do you need guidance? Do you need direction? This is the time to really seek God for your life and areas in your life. Many times, prayer is, our answers are delayed. Anybody have delayed prayers? They're still waiting. They're still waiting. So a lot of times when we set our hearts to seek God and fast, there are opposing forces. Ephesians 6.12 says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly place, places. And a great example of this is in Daniel chapter 10. Verse 2, it says, In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. We have done Daniel fasts in the past three, four weeks, and it was awesome. But we're doing five days to really seek God and deny ourselves of our fleshly desires for food. But down in verse 12, it says, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. So we have to realize there's powers, there's principalities that are fighting in the heavenly host here, heavenly places that are hindering our prayers sometimes. So don't get discouraged. Keep praying. Keep pressing in. Keep believing because God's going to answer. As we said at the beginning, you call upon him, he will answer. But there may be some delays, and I just want to encourage you. We've some been praying for a long time, but we need to keep praying. I know people here, you know, um, when we couple it with prayer, though, there is power. There's power in prayer and fasting. And I was going to say there's some here that are suffering with cancer and need a miracle. Many have been praying for years for loved ones, for way with children, or, you know, there's so many things. You fill in the blank. As we said, be specific. You know what areas in your life you need God to work in. But when we get serious enough to deny ourselves from the physical realm, it will be amazing what God will do. I like what Arthur Waller says in his book, God's Chosen Fast. He said, fasting is designed to make prayer mount up on eagle's wings. It is calculated to give an edge to a man's intercessions and power to his petitions. Heaven is ready to bend its ears to listen when someone prays with fasting. That's powerful. God is desiring us to pray and fast, to seek him with everything within us. Sometimes we just have to get a little desperate for a situation in our life to break, right? or to see the answers, and this is a way. Fasting is a powerful, powerful weapon, and fasting and prayer moves the hand of God. So I want to encourage you that when we join next week together corporately, let's come together and believe for those areas in your life. Stop praying with your whole heart. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep pressing in. Claiming the promises of God. Exercising your faith and expecting like your answer is on the way, because it is. Amen? God bless. You guys encouraged already? We got two more letters, so. 
This morning I'm going to be speaking on the topic of self-control. I don't know about you, but this is a very difficult principle in my own life. I've struggled with it since I was younger. You know, I was thinking, um, many of you know my mom adopted eight kids, and I remember she would do her Costco trips. If you don't know what Costco is, it's like a BJ's. And I remember she'd get in the 15-passenger van, because that's what we had growing up for transportation, and she'd, she'd go to Costco and fill up her three or four carts worth of food for the week, more like the month, but she would come home, and I don't know if any of you have ever been to the beach and you've seen someone just throw their food up in the air, and you watch the seagulls just come and just attack, and that's what it was like when the 15-passenger van pull, pulled up to our house, and uh, my mom was back from Costco. We'd fly out of the house like vultures, grabbing the snacks, grabbing the food, and my mom screaming, beating us over the head, telling us to get away, get back. Self-control is something that's so important in the life of a believer. But living the life of a believer isn't always easy, is it? And so fasting is something that can help point fingers in our lives to things that need more self-control. And not in a way of condemnation, but in a way of, as Pastor Lisa was sharing, freedom. We can learn to have freedom when we learn to have self-control over certain things. And so the scripture that I felt led to share is in 1 Peter 4, verses 7, where it says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. And in this life of a believer, many of you maybe have been a believer for most of your lives. Maybe some of you are newer in the face within the year, and maybe some of you sitting here or listening have never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, and we hope that you do, and we offer that to you as well. But wherever you are in that season of your lives, Peter, looking back in the beginning of verse 4, because when you read a, a verse, it's important to read the before and after so you can understand context, isn't it? And so Peter writes this. He says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer, for human passions, but for the will of God. When we are believers, it's a battle and a fight to no longer live the way that we were living before we knew Christ. Amen? It's a battle every day, every hour, it seems like it's a battle to make sure that we're not going back to the things of the past, back to the vices of the past. And as Pastor Maureen was sharing, that there is spiritual principalities that are at battle for our souls each and every day that don't take rest. And so fasting is an important way to learn to have self-control. And so what do we have self-control for? Look what he goes on to say in verse 3. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. And Gentiles just worldly. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. These were the things that we did before we knew Christ. These were the things that we were involved in before, that we, knew, before we knew Christ. But sometimes once we accept Christ, these same things try to come back. They try to pull us back. And so fasting is a way to have self-control in our lives, whatever your vice may be this morning, amen? And so we need to be encouraged that when we fast, it helps us to have control over the things that want to have control in our own lives, amen? And the interesting thing is when you accept Jesus and you begin walking this new life, there's a change that happens within you, but there's also a change that happens within the people that you're around. Because he goes on to say in verse 4, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join with them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. Isn't that what happens? We get saved, we hear of this Jesus, we begin to change our pasts, and what happens is the people around us begin to notice that change as well. When we no longer live in those sins, those things that were controlling our bodies, controlling our lives in the past, no one wants to be around someone who is self-disciplined. You ever notice that in your own life? You don't want to be around that because what it does is it magnifies your issues. And so when we begin walking this new life in Christ and we live around people who have not accepted that yet, sometimes their reaction is going to be surprise first. And then it says they begin to malign you. And so sometimes we can get mocked for our faith. And so it's important to understand now, as we read the scripture, the main scripture, in verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. The disciples at this time were living a life 
ready that Jesus was going to be coming back. They thought the end times were at that point. And we've been talking a lot about the end times the past couple of years as a church. And so we have to understand that the end is at hand. And we have to have self-control over these things so that we can walk according to the purposes and plans that God has for our lives. Amen? That word self-control also is translated to be of sound judgment. That means to put a moderate estimate on oneself. It also means to think of oneself soberly or in moderation or self-restraint. It also means to curb one's passions. What that means is when Tara comes home from Stop and Shop with my favorite ice cream. To leave some for her. That pint is not for me and it's not one serving. She'll go in and I'll eat just enough for maybe a little scoop. And she's always like every time, self-control. We need it. She's praised for me. Don't worry. It's disciplining ourselves. Sober spirit also means to be calm. When we fast, the Lord can give us a calm spirit. And if we as a church, when you go into your workplaces, just imagine when you're fasting and God gives you that calmness. I don't know about you, but when you go through something and you're around someone who you know is always calm, they're always steady, doesn't that bring peace to your own life? You can be that in your own workplaces. That spirit of of soberness, that spirit of calmness can come on when we pray and fast. Amen? And my last thought is we never know what's going to come down the pipe. But fasting can help us prepare for that. Just this past month in November, I felt God just call me to fast. And, and I talked with Tara and just and did the Daniel fast. And I had no idea why. I had no, and, and the Lord didn't speak it to me. We just felt to do it. And we did it. And let me tell you, with what has come down the pipe just the past few weeks, God, I, we have just felt God's peace. We've felt God's restoration. And we've just felt this, this calm, this sobering spirit as we have been dealing with what happens in life. Things happen out of our control. Circumstances change just like that. But fasting can help us be self-controlled and have that calmness that the Spirit wants us to live out. Amen? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Appreciate um, the staff that has gone before. They're good people. Maureen, Lisa, Mike, sincere people. Um, amen. Give them a clap of appreciation. You know, we meet for staff every Tuesday, and uh, we go over the ministry schedule and planning and vision. And a lot of the time, we're we're talking about you. It's all good, but we're praying for you. And many times in our, our times together, we pray with tears. So I want you to know these are sincere people, as you well know or else they wouldn't be on staff with me. And if I wasn't sincere, they wouldn't be on staff with me. Amen. So it goes both ways. But thank God for their lives and their ministries. And just the last letter in the acronym or acrostic, I will never get that straight no matter how long I try, uh, is the letter T in turn. Joel chapter 2, if you would turn to Joel chapter 2, we'll look at a couple of verses of scripture. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return To the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders. Turn. The scripture tells us, the Lord speaking through the prophet Joel says, Turn to me with all of your heart, with fasting. 
And the prophet Joel, we don't know the exact context of when he prophesied, what king, what uh, time period in Israel history. It might have been around 7, 800 B.C. But what we do know from the scriptures was that at this time, the people of God, because of their disobedience, because they were not following and obeying the word of God, God sent a judgment. This judgment was in the form of locusts. And these locusts would come, and it would be, the scriptures said, it would be like the Garden of Eden, green, fruitful, plush, before the locusts. But after the locusts ravaged the land or came through the land, it would be like the wilderness. They would strip everything bare. They would totally devastate the land. So that meant there would be no more grain, there would be no oil, there would be no wine. That means that there would be economic disaster. There would be total, total devastation. And the prophet would say this was the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord would come and it would be a judgment in the land. And this would also be a precursor and also Joel will mention about a future day of the Lord when God would judge mankind when God would judge the whole world in righteousness and truth, and he would bring judgment on those that disobey and blessing upon his people. But in this passage of Scripture, or in this book of Joel, it it really speaks of this day of the Lord, as opposed to the day of man. You know, man would do what they what they would do in this world. Um, Men, nations, kings would do what, what they want to do. But you know what? The day of the Lord will come. In other words, God will have the final say. God will do what he said he'll do in his word. But what interests me in this passage of Scripture, especially in chapter 2, after all of this judgment has come, and this judgment upon God's people was because of the consequences of their sin, because of their wrong choices, because of their foolish decisions that we all, uh, at one time or another, are guilty of making. And our wrong choices, our sin, our disobedience reaps consequences, doesn't it? The Bible says, do not be deceived. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. He who sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. So there are consequences. And we see in the book of Joel, we see the consequences of the people of God. Now, these are not... uh, um, Uh, Gentiles, these are not people who do not know God. These are God's people who failed to honor and live according to the covenant. And so God brings judgment. You say, why does God bring judgment? Because he's holy, he's just, and our sin must have their consequences. There must be, and, and, and all of God's judgments are redemptive. All of God's judgments are the for the purpose of turning, turning his people back to him. You see, God's judgments are really his mercies. If God didn't judge us, we would continue to walk in the wrong direction until we would walk right into hell. So God's judgments are really his mercies because God is calling us, wooing us, uh, drawing us back unto himself that we might turn to him. Now, what I like is this verse 12. And I like the way um, the New International Version says, the New International Version puts it this way, even now, even now, turn to me. Even now. And I I like that because that, that speaks of an encouragement. That speaks of a hope. God is saying, listen, no matter what's going on before, Even though you are reaping the consequences of your wrong choices, even though there's judgment, God says, even now, turn to me. It's a word of hope. It's a word of encouragement. It is God saying, it doesn't matter how bad it's been, even though you are reaping the consequences of your wrong choices, even though there's been devastation in the land, God's saying, even now, turn to me. What a good word, amen? What a hope for every single one of us because every single one of us can look at our lives and and, and look with, with stark reality and sobering reality and say, you know what, I am reaping some of the consequences of my sin. Turn to the person next to you say, you're not so holy that you're not reaping some things. 
But even now, a sense of no matter what has gone on before, even now, turn to me. Even though there's been judgment, even though there's been uh, consequences, even though there's been suffering, it might have been bad, it might, been, it might seem hopeless, it might even seem beyond. God says, even now, right now, right now, let's turn to the Lord. Let's turn to God with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Even now, no matter what you are going through, no matter what the consequences, even the judgment of God. That's why the Bible says, God, even in judgment, he remembers mercy. The Bible says it's because of the Lord's mercies, you are not consumed. You know that word consumed in the original Hebrew means to be incinerated. You know, God could, could have zapped you and me. It's because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Hallelujah. The part that we play in this is just pivoting. The part we play is turning. That word turn, and that's what the word repentance means in the Greek, met metanoe. It means to turn. It means to change your mind change your thinking it means that you realize you're going in the wrong direction and now you turn and you make a decision to walk in the other direction so we turn to the Lord with fasting with weeping that weeping means a brokenness a grieving a mourning a grieving for sin to say we're truly sorry a lot of times we say we're sorry because we got caught we're not sorry because we did wrong. We're sorry because we got caught. But the King David said this in the Psalms, and I love this. He said, I will be in anguish over my sin. Meant, he meant, I'm going to truly grieve because, not just because of the consequences that affected me, but because I broke the heart of God, because I sinned against the holy God who loves me and who cares for me, and I will mourn and I will grieve because he's so compassionate and he's so good. And I love him. Come, can you say amen? Rend your heart and not your garments. Meaning deal with the inward. And so through a fast, and as I bring this to a close, we want to turn to God. And you know, in the scriptures, Daniel, Nehemiah, when they prayed and fasted, part of it was they confessed their sins, but they confessed the sins of, their na of the nation. And we need to confess our sins, but we need to pray for our nation we need to pray for the nations of the world because we're beginning to see, just like the locust came and it was a precursor of the final judgment, we're seeing judgment on this world beginning to take place in various forms that are pointing towards and, and a warning signs for the end times, the real end, the real, the ultimate day of the Lord. But look what the Word of God tells us. Now, therefore, or even now, turn to me, says the Lord, with all of your heart, with fasting. Then it goes on to say, verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land. He will pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain, new wine, and oil. You know what that is? That is um, Joel chapter 1, verse 10, what was devastated by the locust. God is saying, what? I judged you, how I judged you, I am going to restore and give you back. Even though you deserve that, God says, I'm going to bless you. What a good God we serve. What an amazing God we serve. What a loving God. What a gracious God we serve. Amen. And then he goes on to say, and, and, and I will, you will be satisfied. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove far from you the northern army. I will drive them away. Verse 21, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Then down to verse 25 and some of the most wonderful promises, and I want you to receive this. I want, I want our church to receive it. I want our families to receive it. I want each and every life to receive this. Verse 25, so I will restore to you the years the swarming locust have eaten the crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army which I sent among you. 
You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt one wondrously with you for my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am the Lord in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Amen. God wants to bring restoration. God wants to restore years. You know, we cannot buy back time. We cannot... We cannot make up for lost time. But God says, I'll restore the years. That's a wonderful promise. I think we all live with regret. We all live with lost, wasted opportunities and lost time. But God says, you know what? I'm going to restore the years. I'm going to restore. You know that devastation? I'm going to bring it back to you. Let's believe during the fast as we consecrate ourselves for five days. Personally, I'm going to... Uh, do a total fast or just liquids, no, no foods. Whatever you choose to do, do something significant. Not just fast, but come out to pray. Every night we're going to do something differently. We're going to have it youth-led. We're going to have young adults lead it. We're going to have a miracle healing night. We're going to have a guest speaker. We're going to have just different variety. But each and every time, it's going to be an opportunity for the people of God to come to the house of God. In, in a few of these verses, it says, Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, gather the children and the nursing babes. The bridegroom, let him go out from his chamber, the bride from her dressing room. You know what that was saying? Saying it can't be business as usual. We've we got to disrupt the normal course of life and disrupt our plans a little bit and call everybody to come to the house of God. Bring everybody. Let's seek God. Let's, let's consecrate this. Let's call upon God. Let's be desperate. The Bible says let the, the elders come. Let the priests weep between the porch and the altar. Let it be a consecration to God. Amen. Let's stand together. So it'll be the first full week, the first Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 8.30 every night, 12 to 1 every day. We're doing it a little differently. We're adding more prayer times. We're lengthening the actual prayer meeting times. We've done 21-day Daniel fast. We've done seven-day fast. This is going to be five days, five days of a consecration to God. I want to encourage every single one of you that is a part of the church, part of ministry, to step up to do more than you've ever done before. If you've never done anything, do something. If you've done something, do more. Whatever it is, let's, let's, let's raise the standard. Amen. Let's bring it up to another level. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray. Would you bow your hearts and just let the Lord, let the Holy Spirit just settle his word in your heart and the challenges that you've heard this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, we praise you. And we thank you, God, that you do give us wonderful promises in your word. And God, we don't live by our feelings. We don't live by the words of man. We live by the word of God. We live by the promises of God. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just seal the word of God in our hearts. Let there be a yes and an amen in each one of us. Let there be a responsiveness God, as, as we've heard this morning in this acrostic, Father, let, let your truth, let your word ring loud and clear in our spirits as you call our church to enter into a new year, God, with prayer and fasting. Father God, we pray a blessing over the word. We pray a blessing over the hearts and the minds today that have heard and received the word of God. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you. God bless you. Go in peace. In Jesus' name.